Today we'll talk about Irma's Edemix core. Uh, so Edemix is a set of cryptographic uh, protocols, and the Irma is an implementation of Edemix, uh, of our Idemix, I should say. Uh, and today we'll explain to you how Idemix works, how, what, what its goals are, and, so, and how it achieves uh, those goals. In particular, we'll focus on the selective and unlinkable attribute disclosure. So, who are we to talk about that? Well, this is Maya Reisner. She's a software developer at SIDN. Um, and I am Siet Seringers. Uh, I am the architect of IRMA, also at SIDN. And together we work on, uh, 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 on IRMA. Um, yeah, so uh, the IRMA is now developed um, at SIDN. Uh, previously, it was developed at the Privacy by Design Foundation. Uh, but since uh, the, uh, the beginning of, pre of the previous year, it, uh, the development moved over to SIDN. Um, so we do hope you have some familiarity with, uh, with IRMA itself. Um, perhaps you've already seen it. And some familiarity with uh, basic cryptography um, may, uh, would also help. Uh, but, but, but we'll see how, uh, you know, we'll, we'll guide you through, through everything. All right. So, IRMA is an implementation of a self-sovereign identity system, right? Um, uh, so, in, in, uh, in a self-sovereign identity system such as IRMA, in the center, there is the user. Yo, this is not visible, right? The pointer. Sort of? Okay, right. So, in the center of things, there is the user, right? And the user wants to authenticate herself at some Verifier. Perhaps it's a web shop, it, uh, but it could be uh, a, a physical as well, like here. It could be basically anything. Um, so the, the user wants to authenticate herself at, uh, at the verifier, perhaps to, to convince the verifier that, uh, that she has a diploma of sorts. It could be anything. So there's the user, there's the verifier, and then on the other hand, there is the issuer. Um, an issuer can, can be basically a, 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 any trusted institute, such as for, uh, a local government, you know, who knows my, my name and age and my social security number. Or it could be a university, say, that knows that I ob obtained a diploma of some sort. Um, and then they are trusted issuers because they are generally trusted by other, uh, by, by other parties within society. And what we want a system like this to do um, is that the, an issuer, uh, it issues to you a credential, so a piece of data that, that you then have in your app uh, that you control. Um, so you store it in, in your app, in your IRMA app. And then at some later stage, you can disclose uh, that, uh, you can use that credential to authenticate yourself towards such a verifier, probably a web shop or something, as I said. Um, and uh, within that verification transaction, the issuer is not explicitly involved. So it gives you the credential, but after that, its, it's role is done, so to say. Right? Um, so um, you use that credential towards the verifier, um, and since there is a trust relationship between the verifier and the issuer, you know, the, the, the verifier is going to trust the, the, the Dutch government to say truthful things about me or you, um, it works, right? So then the verifier decides you're authenticated and the thing can go ahead. So there's the, dis uh, there's the holder in the middle um, there's, and there's the disclosure part. There's also issuance, but in this talk we're mainly going to fo focus on the verification part because it's, well, it's the most important part of, of Idemix and IRMA and it's also the most interesting part. Okay. So. Let's see a little how, how um, just to get a feeling of things, let's first see in, uh, in this introduction how authentication might work offline, you know, in the, in the more traditional sense. Uh, so here, here's a sort of representation of a diploma that I uh, uh, obtained in some uh, back in 2016 at the University of Groningen. Right? And now let's, so this is, uh, for now this represents an actual paper diploma. I have it at home, it's a huge thing, and it has this, this, uh, this red uh, stamp, signature stamp on it that's, that's supposed to signify its authenticity. 
Um, and suppose now that I would want to use this diploma to apply for a job someplace. Perhaps it's a job that requires that I have a PhD. Um, so uh, this use case, by the way, we will use in, in various uh, uh, formats and, and ways throughout the talk. So we'll, we'll see this coming back as we go along through the talk, right? So, okay, if I have such a diploma, that, well, the, I guess the easiest thing that I could do would, would be I can just take it with me when I apply for that job, right? And I show it to my uh, prospective employer, and then he is convinced that I have a PhD, and it's fine. So that's, that, that works. We can go slightly further. We can do more things with such a paper uh, diploma. That might, be, that might be cool, right? What we could do is we, might, uh, we could make a paper, a copy of it, just using a copy machine, you know, the old-fashioned things, and then scratch out some of these things, right? Because perhaps for the job that I applied to, it's not particularly important uh, what my exact name is. It's just important that I have a PhD, right? So um, a, a, using a copy, a paper copy of an actual diploma allows you to do what we call selective disclosure of the attributes on your diploma. So the bold stuff here, here um, as, it, as it is, and, and here we call attributes, basic small pieces of data about yourself. So on your copy, you can scratch some of them out, and then uh, the, the, the one that I show it to knows just the important parts for the, for the particular thing I want to do. So that's a cool, uh, cool feature to have, right, in our credentials system. Uh, so I guess it works, but it also doesn't really, because um, if, I g if I make a paper copy um, of my own diploma and I scratch out some fields and I would give that to you as my prospective employer, then you have that, have that, that copy, and then you could use it to try to convince others that you, in fact, have a PhD. So we have a problem of replay attacks here, right? So we don't want that in our system. So that's an issue we'll, we'll have to try and solve, right? So we have a feature now that we want and a problem that we want, and there is an additional feature that's kind of cool in, the, in this offline setting. Um, there is sort of unlinkability. Uh, that means if I, in this case, if I make a second copy um, of, uh, I make a second paper copy of my diploma, and then again, I scratch out some of those fields, but just in a different way, with different scratches and a different pen or whatever. So the new copy doesn't look anymore like the old copy. Uh, it's, it looks different because I scratched it differently. So that means it's no longer, it, it, it's no longer visible that it's, it's, it's a copy of the same underlying actual diploma or credential. So the ones that I give these copies to, they cannot in fact see that those two copies both belonged to me. So this is a feature that's called, that we call unlinkability, and this too would be a very nice feature to have, right? So these are some, some features that we, that we might want to have in our credential scheme. Okay, so now we want to do all of this, but in a digital domain, it's easy. Right, so the, uh, the goal of this talk is basically to be able to understand this piece of code. Uh, this code comes from uh, a software repository called Gavi, uh, which you can find on GitHub, and Gavi is our actual IDMX implementation. This particular piece of code verifies uh, a, a signature on an IRMA credential. Um, so actually what it verifies is that this particular equation holds, this is a verif the verification equation of, uh, of an IRMA or IDMX credential. So that means that we're going to explain all of the, the different ingredients of this formula later on. Uh, we'll see this formula throughout the talk. But, but what it means is that um, if your credential and, and its signature on it satisfy that formula, then it is valid. That is what this piece of code establishes, checks. So a small table of contents for the remainder of this talk. Um, first, we'll talk about a selective disclosure that I mentioned just now. Um, and uh, for, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, to, to see how you can achieve that, we'll first look at how you can distinguish the various attributes within that formula and within the code from each other. Um, then we'll show you, once you have done that, uh, how you can hide the, the, uh, the attributes that are not relevant to a particular transaction to actually achieve the selective disclosure. Next, we'll talk about um, ownership of the credential, so how you can really bind it to the person about which it states things. 
then we will talk about unlinkability, so how we can, how we can transfer that, pay, that, that property that we saw earlier in the paper case to our digital setting. And finally, we'll, do, uh, we'll talk about how we can combine all of that to achieve disclosure of multiple credentials um, it, out of your IRMA wallet. And with that, I give the word to Maya. Please do. Hello. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me now? Nice. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy that you're here because this is so much nice stuff, and I'm just also amazed that so many people want to know how it works. Um, you have a little handout. It is meant to help you eventually. Don't worry about it yet. If you don't understand it yet, that's why we have the session. So we will. Um, start very basic, we will start with just digital signatures and have a look at how they work. Uh, on the right hand side you will see our example that we will talk about all of the time. In this it's the diploma again with a little bit less information than we saw before. It's the name, Sitzeringes, and a bit of a text and a PhD with a stamp. So how would this digitally look like? Well, the complete data of the diploma would be represented by just a number, M in this case, and if M, uh, if the signers at the university who will issue this diploma can then take this number M to the power of a secret value D, a modulus N, and it will result in the signature A. This is textbook RSA, and I will not cover this any further. You can just look it up. And if you don't know it in details, it's OK. You should still be able to follow the talk to some degree. <laughs> um, the verifier then later on can take the signature, take it to the power of the public value E, and it should result again in this signature number M modulus M. So Sitsa already talked about uh, selective disclosure. And if we want to get there, we want to hide data. This is currently not possible with this system, because if we change anything in the diploma data, we will change the number M. And uh, the signature will not hold anymore the equation. So uh, we need to find a means to differentiate uh, first between the different uh, things that we might, may or may not want to uh, show, uh, and we can do this as follows. Um, please focus on the right-hand side first. Uh, we can first split the diploma into different attributes. So it's not a blob of text anymore, but it's different attributes with attributes types, in this case, name and title, and the values, Sigtze Ringers, and a PhD. Um, Please don't panic about the formula. We will go into detail with all of the stuff here. Um, please now focus only on the little a's. Uh, the values on the right-hand side, Sitzeringes and the PhD, are represented as two numbers, A1, which is Sitzeringes, and A2, which is the PhD. The attribute types, that is the name and the title, will be represented in this equation by R1 and R2. Um, Z will be used for forgeability reasons. S will be used by the power of this V um, later on for unlinkability. But don't worry about it yet. Just see that we now have a formula um, where we can differentiate between these values. All the capital letters are constants and public values. And now we just accept that it's there. Um, don't worry about it yet. And replace uh, our M in the formula above. This will. Um, look like as follows. We get a to the power of e, this will stay the same, we replace m, um, and we have an equation. This equation um, is part of the so-called Kamenis lisianskaya signature scheme. And this signature scheme is uh, used in EDMX and also in EMA. So we will focus on this for quite, uh, like, almost the whole talk. Um, we will only do the verification, and the verification is this equation. Um, I told you already that those capital letters are constants. There's an E and an V that actually become part of the signature. You can already see that on the right-hand side here, and we will go into details. Um, actually, now. <laughs> we, do have a, we will now have a little so detour to our diploma example, and I'll just say a couple more words on the signature scheme so you have a bit more context on it. Um, 
The Chameleon Schlesian Sky Signature Scheme is quite a um, mouthful. That's why most people just abbreviate it, um, abbreviate it with CL Signature Scheme. So you may have heard that before. Um, if we now just have a bit of a look at issuance setup and issuance, uh, then you have a bit more context, and we will see that it's somewhat RSA-like. Similar to RSA, we will begin by choosing the private key with two prime numbers P and Q, which if you multiply them with each other will result in N, a public value. Then you will also choose a couple of constants that the issuer just use uh, at setup, so the university does this once, and they will all become part of the public key. For each attribute type, you will choose uh, a different um, constant R. So it's R, one, two, three, four, as many attribute types as you have. Then later on, when you actually issue the diploma, um, so it's really each time a credential is issued, um, the two numbers E and V are chosen, and then the issuer calculates the number A by actually doing the same as you would do with uh, RSA, but then replace um, the, the M again. It will result in a signature that is a triple, because each time the credential is issued, a different E and V are chosen. So that's different uh, from uh, RSA2. For this whole signature scheme, the strong RSA assumption holds. OK, but we won't focus on that. We will focus on the right-hand side, just on the verification equation. And what were we doing so far? We had a look at the diploma. We want to hide data. We can't hide data yet. We only can differentiate between data in the diploma. And we will now have a look at the hiding part. Going back to our example, we now want to hide the name. And if we have a look at, at this uh, formula, because of the discrete logarithm problem, uh, which states that uh, the exponent is, is infeasible to find if you only know the result and the basis of an exponentiation, we can actually hide already this attribute value uh, A1 just by not sharing A1 with the verifier, but the result of the calculation, so just sharing H. Um, all other things will stay the same. So hiding itself is quite easy, but we're not there yet. The signature scheme does more than that. If this would be the only thing, we would actually be uh, vulnerable to uh, forgeability attacks. And we will have now an example first to see how this would look like. Again, lots of changes. <laughs> we will focus on the uh, left hand side first. Um, and the example of the diploma changed a bit because I think it's easier to follow the example uh, having a number and not uh, a string in, in mind. So in my new example, I still have a name that I will hide, but the second attribute will be age 17. And in my uh, forgery example, uh, I could forge my age, my age to 18 as follows. I could just claim that my age is 18. And then I would not share my name, but I would share a number again, because I am hiding my name in a number. If I would now not calculate this number as shown above, but just accept that I would calculate it by taking this number times r2 to the power of minus 1, we would um, still the claim would hold in the equation of verification that uh, my age is 18, although the issuer never issued it. So the verifier would then check if the equation holds using the wrong number, but he can't differentiate it from a usual age, um, which um, makes the equation still hold because h prime is the same as h time r2 to the power of minus 1. And if you rewrite it, you get uh, eventually r2 to the power of a2 minus 1. And our a2 was chosen as 18, minus 1 is 17 which holds in the equation because this was actually issued. This is not what happens because the signature scheme takes care of that. How do, do we do that? We actually have to um, prove that we know the number A, that we know this attribute value without disclosing it. And there's now some real cool math coming where I really can't imagine how people think of that, but it works and it's beautiful. Um, the Kamenius-Lizinskaya signature scheme uses 
uh, Schnorr Zero Knowledge Protocol. It's a protocol from the 90s, and um, it's a three steps protocol that we will now have a look at. For simplicity, I removed all the indices. The indices are used for um, indicating which attribute we're talking about, but it becomes messy, so I skipped them. We start by the given thing that we have, um, this age, which we publicly can share, because it doesn't say anything about the, the, the value of A already, and it's defined by R to the power of A. Now, on the left-hand side, we have um, we the prover, and on the right-hand side, we have the verifier. It starts by choosing um, a random value, T, which is really big. Then we calculate U as uh, R to the power of T, modulus N, and send U just over to the verifier. This is called the commitment phase. Then in the next phase, the challenge phase, the um, verifier chooses a random value L, uh, C, the challenge, and sends it over uh, to, uh, to us again. Now we calculate the response, which is this huge value T, plus the challenge times the attribute value. Um, T thereby masks the attribute value because it's so big you can't really see A anymore, and sends across R. This is the response uh, phase, and in, uh, eventually the verifier just checks if this uh, equation holds. And if this equation holds, it's actually a proof that we know the number without having shared the number. So this is a bit of magic, um, but it's actually the proof is not that difficult. Um, once you see it, it's difficult just to make it up, but I didn't, so that's fine. Um, I will go through this very quickly. It, it's just meant to show you that you can understand this and you can look it up and it's not rocket science. So here on the left-hand side, we start um, just what we have on the left-hand side and we want to end up on uh, to you on the right-hand side. First, we can write this, this small letter R as what it is, T plus CA. Then we can split those because it's a product of both. It's really just school math. On the right-hand side, we can replace our H with R to the power of A because we defined that earlier. Exponentiation by exponentiation is the same as multiplying the exponents. Um, then we can see that they actually cancel out the, to the power of CA and to the power of minus CA. They just cancel each other out which leaves us with r to the power of t, which is by definition here above the same as u. Again, this was a bit of a, of a side thing in your mind, but what we now have is actually that we have our diploma where we have different attributes and we can hide an attribute by using this age discrete logarithm thing, plus um, we prove that we know the value. There's actually a second feature that is interesting in the Schnorr protocol, and we'll have a look at that now. You may have already noticed that there's a challenge and a response in there, in the name. Uh, and Sietze already mentioned earlier with the, the paper diploma that, um, well, may, we may have replay attacks. Um, challenge response uh, mechanisms are used to prevent replay attacks, so let's have a look at if this already works. Again, back to the example, um, Sietze would now share um, his data with me. He would do the challenge response with me. I would not see the name, but he would just prove knowledge of it, and I would have the diploma. So I have all the data. Now, can I do a replay attack? Well, actually, yes, I can. Because if I now prove to any one of you that I have this diploma without the name in it, I could, well, do a commitment. You sent me a challenge. He didn't send it to me, but I know Sita's name. So at that moment, I um, know uh, I can still calculate R. Uh, the, proof, the, the freshness proof is still valid, and I could send the response. So in order to um, prevent that, we cannot use any attribute type that you will ever share. It must be a secret one. So um, we can now add an extra attribute, which we give the index zero, and this is a secret value that Sietze will never share, so I can never um, do a replay on, tech, on that. Okay, did I miss something? Oh, yeah, little, little remark. Um, it's a signature scheme, and by using this secret value, we can actually use it as a credential scheme. 
um, and that's what we're doing. Okay, let's go on. Um, we now know how to uh, hide data, we know ownership of a credential. Do we have unlinkability yet? Well, if we look at the right-hand side, it, it seems so, because, well, we have hidden data, which just looks different every time, and we have this PhD, which is not really relatable to the person. However, there's still a signature. The signature consists of those three numbers, and as we see them here, they're currently still the same. This is not what happens in the signature scheme. Let's have a look how we can hide this data. Well, for E and V, it's actually not that difficult to hide the data because they're also used in the exponents in the equation. So we can use the same mechanism as we already used for hiding other data in our diploma. We can just use that for E and V too, and that would be fine. However, however there is still A left. We can't just hide uh, A with this dec discrete logarithm because it's not in the exponent. And, well, if we now want to change that, we, can't, we, we must change something on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the uh, verification equation, otherwise it won't verify anymore. And this is possible, and it's possible as follows. We're making A unlinkable by choosing a random number R, and then we define um, something with what we will replace A. We will replace A by A tilde, which we define as A times S to the power of R modulus N. And on the right-hand side, we replace V with V tilde, um, which is defined as V minus ER. So why does this work? Well, that's why. Um, if we now replace it, um, A tilde is the same as what we just defined it as, then we have it to the power of E, so we can put that E into both of the, the bases. We re can replace the complete A to the power of E um, with the right-hand side of the equation. Then we have twice this number S to the power of something, which we can put together, so we get S to the power of V minus ER in here, and V minus ER is our definition of V tilde. Again, don't worry if you don't really follow this now, because you can look it up, but it's, it's correct. It works. It's mathematically, um, it works. What does this mean? Well, this actually is, um, uh, it means it technically wor works, and just when you imagine how this really works in practice, uh, it would be as if you had this paper diploma, you have a signature, you hide lots of data, you hide even parts of the signature, and then before showing it, each time before showing it, you just change it a bit, and then you show it, and it's still valid. So I think this, this is a really awesome mechanism, um, and it's really fun to, to work with it. Um, we now have actually all those single features that we wanted to have, and um, Sietze will now continue in putting this to a complete picture, so more math. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, so let's first have a little short summary of what we've seen so far, because it was a lot, right? So we started with just RSA, where, uh, where the letter M there contains the entire diploma, just as a big blob. Then uh, into M, we distinguished uh, each of the attributes, uh, resulting in the formula there at the bottom, right? Next, we obtained a way to hide irrelevant attributes using zero-knowledge proofs, where we uh, prove that we know the attributes without actually sh showing them. Uh, we bonded it through the user um, using the secret, um, the secret over there, uh, which is a zero in the formula here. And finally, we even gained unlinkability uh, by, uh, by hide either hiding all of the expo uh, uh, exponents in the zero-knowledge proof or modifying uh, the, the, the big letter A each time before you, uh, before you use it. Right. So let's, uh, having, having seen all that, let's now look at how all of that works uh, together in an actual disclosure in this, in this following slide. So this slide shows you the, 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 the disclosure protocol um, of Idemix um, for, uh, for a single credential, right? So let's suppose that we want to disclose the attribute number two, the, the, the PhD attribute, the one on the bottom there, right? So that way we want to show, and then uh, the other ones we will hide. Okay, 
So the first thing we do is what Maya just explained. Uh, we, uh, we modify our, our A into, our, into a, a, a tilde using the random number R. And similarly, we, we uh, randomize our, our V into a V tilde uh, using, again, the, the value R. Um, and then for, uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for, these, uh, for, for these ingredients, the verification equation that we've seen so far, it still holds, as Maya hope just convinced you. So th um, for our A tilde and V tilde and all of the other ingredients, this holds. And next, let me take the same equation, but slightly rearranged. So it's, it, it looks a bit different, but it's actually the same statement. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, modify it into this. Um, so now we have um, uh, all of the exponents that we want to hide using the zero knowledge proof. We have that on the right hand side and all of the known stuff that's on the left hand side. Uh, so you can get from the upper equation to the bottom equation by multiplying both sides by uh, um, as SV tilde and, and these parts, and then you get exactly this. So it's the same statement, it just looks a little different. And now let's call this thing H again, just to have a name to refer to in what, in what follows. Okay, so for this thing, uh, in particular for the exponents on the right hand side, we now want to prove knowledge, right? So th what we're going to do now is we are going to uh, execute a single proof of knowledge protocol that simultaneously, simultaneously proves knowledge of all four of those exponents. So what does that look like? It looks basically the same as, uh, as Maya showed you earlier, just some of the steps times four. So the first thing we do is we choose four random numbers um, for each of the numbers that we want to hide. So there's a TE, a T V tilde, a T zero, and a T one big random numbers. And then we perform the following protocol with the verifier. This protocol here. So just as before, we first compute our commitment, the U, um, which is this expression, basically the same equation as this, but with the random numbers in it. Um, and then we send our A tilde and U over to the verifier. The verifier then responds with a random number C called the challenge. It sends it back to us. And then using that challenge, we compute our responses, the, uh, the, the letters R, which are always of the form, the, uh, the big random number, plus the challenge times the secret that we want to hide. So it's that for each of the numbers that we want to hide, and it looks like this. So these four responses we send over to the verifier. The verifier plugs them into that uh, verification equation that we've also seen earlier. It's now just slightly bigger. And if that holds, then the verifier is convinced that we know the attributes and that all of the attributes are val validly signed uh, by the issuer. So this is an IRMA or Itemix disclosure in a single slide for, out of a single credential. This is what happens when you disclose an attribute out of IRMA under the water. But we don't want just one credential. We want to have we we want to have a wallet of credentials, right? Because you can have um, lots of different credentials containing lots of different attributes from distinct issuers, and you want to have all of them within your one wallet. And then you want the ability to combine attributes out of all of your credentials as suits the purpose. So we're going to have to do one final step to go from the right hand side to the left hand side here. Um, so this is a screenshot of the IRMA app uh, showing a, a number of credentials. Um, th th and I might want to add, by the way, that this, this particular look is subject to change, uh, but you'll see that in the, in the coming time. Right. So we have to do uh, one final step to get to where we are. Uh, okay. So, because there is a thing that we have to solve still. Um, if we just naively combine um, the, 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 you, the, the multiple credentials on top of each other using the disclosure protocol that I showed you earlier, we, we introduce a problem that we have to solve. Because there, the issue is, suppose, okay, fine, suppose I have my IRMA app and in it contains a, a credential that states that I have a PhD, right? But suppose I'm careless and I leave my phone just lying over there and Maya picks it up, you know? If she has then control over her wallet as well as mine, so she has control over my credentials as well as hers, can she then combine the two 
for example, to prove uh, to, to simultaneously disclose her own email address and my PhD attribute, right? So that would sort of imply that if, if she were, would be able to disclose those two attributes simultaneously, that would imply that she would have the PhD, while in fact she does not, as far as I know anyway. So we don't want our system to allow you to prove statements that are not factually true. So we'll have to solve this issue. And the way we do that is as follows. We've already seen the secret, um, that, that, the, the secret attribute that each credential has. And the thing that we do is we, we make the issuance protocol of these credentials such that if I get issued a new credential to my wallet, then the issuance protocol ensures that the secret of the new protocol gets this, the, the same value as the, sec, uh, the, as the secret of my other credentials. So the issuance protocol is such that all of the credentials in my wallet, they share the same secret value. So there is one secret which is in all of my credentials. That means that Maya's wallet, will, uh, who, which also contains, cred uh, contains credentials, which also contains secrets, though that secret will have a different value. So my, my secret may be one, two, three, and then her secret is going to be four, five, six. Actually, it's a lot bigger, but, but you get the idea. Okay, and then once we have that, we modify the, the disclosure protocol that we've seen earlier in, in such a way that not only do I, when I disclose my attributes coming out of multiple credentials, not only do I prove that um, I know the attributes that I don't disclose, and all of the attributes are validly signed, but I also prove that the secret out of which all of those attributes are coming, that th that secret has the same value across all of the credentials out of which I disclose attributes. So I can do that because all of the credentials of my wallet actually do have the same secret. And that will prevent the, uh, the attack that I just mentioned because um, the, the credentials in Maya's wallet will not have the same secret value as those from my credentials. So she cannot prove that that is so because it's not. That's the idea. Um, so the final step is to go into a little more detail about how we actually do that. So here again is the, is the, the proof of knowledge protocol that we've seen earlier for a single credential, right? So let's simplify that a bit to, to show just the details that matter to us right now. So we first compute some u, and then we, we send over a, uh, a tilde and u. Next, we get a challenge, and then we compute a bunch of responses of this form, right? And then we send that back over. So that's what that looks like for a single credential. So the naive combination to expand that to multiple credentials would be basically just like this. We do the same thing but for more credentials. Uh, where, where now I use red and blue to distinguish the ingredients of the different credentials, right? So suppose in this particular example that I want to disclose uh, my, uh, my own PhD title and actually my own uh, email address, right? Because it's my email address, so I should be able to do that. So how do we do it? Um, in particular, the, the, these responses here are, are what we're going to, do, to use. And for the, for the secret that we've already seen, which was labeled by zero, that's this, right? So these would be the responses for the two secrets of the credentials out of which I disclose attributes. Well, uh, what we do is actually simple. We, make, we ensure that during the issuance protocol that um, the, the two A0s, that they have the same value, right? I, call, I just called it one to three, for example. So there's just one A0. So let's make it black again, because there's just one. So there's um, one A0 for both of my credentials. There is one challenge, because there is just one within the protocol that we've shown you. And the final step that we need is that um, during the disclosure protocol, um, the, 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 the holder, the prover, or the user, um, it uses the same one T0, one random value for all of these secrets. So it just chooses the one secret, and then uh, the, the one random value is a T0, and then it uses that one uh, T0 for all, of the, uh, for all of the credentials, for all of the secrets. So that means that since all of the ingredients in this particular formula 
are now the same for all of the micro-credentials, this response too is going to be, have the same value for every single credential out of which I disclose my attributes. So there may be more, multiple credentials, but the, res the R0, the response for the, each of the secrets is going to have the same value for all of those credentials. And once we have that, we can just make the verifier enforce that this value R0 always has that one value. So the verifier henceforth disallows the user to send distinct values of R0. It enforces that the user always has one R0 for all of his credentials, and if the user does not, then the disclosure is rejected as invalid. Well, that solves the, solves the issue, because as I explained to you, my secret is going to have the same value for all of my credentials, but my ass will not. That means that this R, uh, if she were to combine, to try the attack that we just mentioned, combining multiple uh, credentials out of multiple wallets, then those R0 values, in her case, are going to differ, because the, the A0 values do, then the verifier will notice and abort. So, in fact, this, this, uh, this secret A0, by enforcing it to have the same value across all of my credentials, it sort of acts as a key ring that really binds all of my credentials together in one big key ring or wallet. So, that is our story. That is in, uh, what the disclosure protocol of, uh, of Idemix looks like. This is what happens when you do an Irma disclosure. So going back to our initial picture, uh, we have now seen how the verification part of this diagram works, right? Um, and by uh, using all of this mechanism, Idemix allows you to have a wallet containing lots of creden uh, credentials, uh, to, which may contain lots of attributes that you can disclose. Um, and you can even do so selectively and unlinkably, which is really awesome, I think. Um, there's lots of more stuff going on here because, as I said, we've just dis um, um, discussed that verification error over here. We have not discussed IRMA schemes, which, which facilitates the upper arrow, the trust relationship. We have not discussed the, the issuance part. And there are still more. We have not discussed the IRMA key share server or, uh, or the verification of attributes once the, their value to, uh, is, ceases to be true. Um, all of that IRMA implements as well, but we'll, you know, we can't fit everything into a single talk. Uh, so if you want to know details about that, come look us up this evening or in the coming days. And with that, I think there's still a little more, little more time for questions. Thank you very much. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sitze uh, and Maya. Uh, we still have five minutes for questions. I see uh, a lineup already. Um, otherwise, you could have uh, explained the rest also. But we have first uh, first question over there. Yeah. Maybe off, but oh, okay, that works. Um, so there's a, a general. So the. Is there any thought in the system given to how um, to prevent attributes being sort of used, misused? So, for example, um, okay, going to, if I'm actually getting a job, it's not much, it's not too difficult. It's kind of annoying that I have like emailed my PhD to lots of people, but that, you know, everybody's done this. But um, so, okay, it would be kind of cool to be able to send something, you know, Somewhat more redacted or whatever, but but anyway, um, is there is there a um, is there any thought to like um, so one of the things that's in the the verify like the verif the old verifiable claims use cases document from the W3C is they wanted that um, it to be used for um, like to prove you had a job to a bank, but of course you don't open a bank account every day. It wouldn't be that much trouble to get a new letter from your thing. But what happens if? Um, if, you're, if I just have this wallet, what happens if now some other parties start asking for this to prove you have a job? So for example, if uh, HR departments want me to prove that I have a job when I apply for a job, yeah. and then they can start binning resumes. And, and for most of the verifiable claims use cases, there's actually this malicious use. It's very easy to find these malicious uses. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, well, the, the first answer, I think, is that um, if you're asked to, to, uh, to disclose some attributes to whoever is asking for them, the Irma app also always gives you the ability to just refuse. There's a big no button, right? 
Um, so there is that, but I don't think that answers your question, not, not, not entirely. Um, the, I think uh, there is a, definitely a risk that a system like this makes it much too easy for potential verifiers to enforce that you authenticate with them, right, using perhaps too much attributes. Um, so uh, that's something that we'll have to be very careful about, and we're, we're aware, aware of it. We have a couple of ideas that, that might help there. Um, for example, the, uh, w w uh, a thing that we might still do is, is uh, implement a button in the Irma app that when it's asking you some attributes um, and you think that it's too much attributes or not appropriate to the situation or that you can then uh, report it to the Dutch Autoriteit Persoonsgegevens, the Authority Personal Data, or to the police, I don't know, or to us, so that then something might be done about it. Um, yeah, so there's not, I mean, why involve uh, the user at all? I would like all? to add something first here, uh, very shortly. We were now only talking about the technical sure. stuff. Okay. So it was really just why it works, so you get some insights, why we claim it is, how it is, so, how, so yeah. you can see that. There are lots of advantages and lots of disadvantages for the complete system to use. Well, this was not what user? we were talking about, but it might be a nice future talk. Yeah, my, my main question, the, the implication of my question was, was why involve the user at all? Why not just have, why not just have the certificate for the person they're identifying it for, say what they're allowed to ask? Can we take this uh, question offline, uh, discuss it later with them, give the other people a, uh, a different question? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, cool talk. How, um, or do you provide your secret key to the issuer? And do you have different secrets for different issuers? Otherwise, can you combine your attributes if they're from different issuers? No, there's one secret, uh, which is reused across all of your credentials, even if they are from different issuers. And that, um, that means that you do have the ability to combine different attributes from different issuers, but that's a feature. So then the issuer knows your secret? Okay. No, no, the issuer does not get to the, the issuance. Ah, that's, a, that's a good question. The issuance protocol, which we have not discussed, is such that um, the issuer, it does ensure that you get the same secret as your earlier credentials. There too, you have to prove knowledge of it, but it does not get to see the actual value um, of that secret. Um, and that too is achieved by zero knowledge proofs. Okay, awesome. So it's actually a double blind signature scheme, and we just really did not talk about this at all. Um, the issuer themselves, they have uh, private keys that they do not share. They only share the public keys and the secret value from uh, the app user will never be shared anywhere, just proven that you know it. Um, I was just wondering how the attribute values are encoded, because I can imagine it results in a bunch of large numbers that you have to do maths with. Sorry, so, I, I, I can you repeat that. the question a little, a little louder? There's no, no, no. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering how the attribute values are encoded, because I can imagine it results in a bunch of big numbers that you ha have to do a lot of maths with. So yeah. are, uh, is the size limited, or is it arbitrary, and are there any performance uh, issues? Uh, it's basically arbitrary. Uh, uh, currently, um, the, the, you just use string encoding, so an attribute is some string, and you just take the UTF-8 encoding of that, and then you, uh, you, you, could, you interpret that as a big number, and that's it. And there is a boundary, um, it, uh, the attributes are by itemix, they are not allowed to exceed 256 bits, but that we solve by just hashing it using SHA-256 if it does, and then you're below it again. Um, so that means that attributes can have basically any size or content. You know, it's not necessarily practical if you have this giant uh, protocol of attributes because it would, um, it, it would look weird in your app, right? But that's another issue. Okay, we have time for one small question. Would, <laughs> can, can you keep it small? Or is it going to be a big question? I'll, I'll try. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, how are key revocations handled? Can you get a bit closer? How are the revocations of um, the keys of the issuers handled? Revocation. So I, I actually there are two papers on that and you can all read it on the documentation on irma.app slash docs. Sietze wrote that down in great detail so I could understand it, so <laughs> you will understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but there are two uh, papers published also by Kamenisch, I guess, and uh, we have an implementation of that. Yeah. I will not go into detail, sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
Uh, thank you very much. I see the same. Uh, can you can you do it out, uh, offline? Thank you very much. Um, on the sides, our QR code is to the GitHub repository of Irma. Uh, I would like to actually the slides. So if oh, you no, I'm sorry, the slides. The, the slides. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a GitHub repository filled with slides. Uh, no code because it's open source. There's also code. There's also code. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, enlightenment uh, this evening, uh, Sietse and Maya. Uh, one final big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks.